These have been challenging times, but the body of Christ has proven itself resilient. We've gathered in different ways, in different places, yet stood steadfast as the church. We have found peace in God's promise to never leave us or forsake us. In our separation, we have remained united. In our struggle, we have lived out our faith. In the midst of the unknown, we have leaned on the strength of an all-knowing God. Throughout history, the church has thrived in adversity, and this moment is no different. The power of God is unstoppable, His love unending, His grace unrelenting, His glory undeniable. Today, no matter where we gather, we remain God's people. Our mission has not changed. Our calling has not been altered, and nothing, absolutely nothing, will ever change that. We are the church, and today we stand resilient. Welcome, and thank you for joining us online. We are so glad that you're here. If you are a guest watching for the first time or you've been with us for a few months, we are glad you're here and we would love to connect with you. If you would, go to our Leewood homepage on our website and click on the connect card, fill that out and we will reach out uh, to you. We would love to get you connected and we would love to get you connected to our church. Now, every week our church and our staff prays for you. And if there's anything that we can join in prayer with you and your family, if you would go to our Leewood homepage on our website, click on the prayer card, fill out the information that you would like us to be in prayer for, and, uh, and share that with us. We would love to be in prayer with you and for you. Now, giving is a really great way to serve God. And if you would love to join us on our mission to serve our local community, uh, we would love for you to share your gift with us by giving either online or sending in your gift to our multi-site office. Now, this week is your last week to register for our annual golf outing. Now, if you've been to Top Golf or maybe you've gone to the driving range, this is a really great opportunity to build community, go on the golf course, and hopefully shoot a great round. Hopefully you will join us. Hi, boys and girls. In this week, ch week's children's ministry moment, we are following Paul on his missionary journey to Philippi, and we're going to see how God delivers. Now, when you hear the word delivers, you might be thinking of the mailman or the UPS driver who brings a package or something that your mom and dad might have ordered. When we hear God delivers, I want you to think of God freeing someone. So, Paul and Silas are in Philippi, and after they go to the temple to pray, they encounter a slave girl who is a fortune teller. That means she predicts the future of people, and she makes her owners a lot of money by doing this. And she follows Paul and Silas around, and Paul realizes she is controlled by God's enemy, Satan. And so he speaks to her and frees her from that bondage. This was great for the slave girl, but not so good for her owners. You see, they were really mad that now they weren't going to be able to make money from her telling the fortunes of others. And so they drag Paul and Silas to the marketplace in front of the authorities and claim that they were causing an uproar in the city. And the authorities cast Paul and Silas in jail. Now, this jail was underground, and it was dark, and everybody was in one room, and their hands and their feet were in bonds, so they couldn't move, um, and they were chained up. I don't know how you would be feeling if you were in jail, but I know I would be scared, uh, maybe a little bit nervous of what was going to happen to me, uh, and I might even be a little angry because I didn't think I deserved to be there. 
But Paul and Silas chose to worship God and they began singing. So everyone in that room knew that they loved the one true God. And as they were singing, God sent a huge earthquake that shook and everything. And it broke the chains that they were wearing and it flew open the prison door so they could be free. Now, this was great for Paul and Silas, but not so good for the jailer. You see, it was his job to make sure that the prisoners didn't escape. And so when he saw the prison doors open, the Bible tells us he grabbed his sword to kill himself because he thought the prisoners were all gone. But Paul and Silas called out to the jailer and said, stop, don't harm yourself, we're still here. And the jailer was amazed and ran up to them and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And Paul and Silas shared with him, believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved in your household. So the jailer believed and took Paul and Silas back to his house where he fed them and cared for them. God did big things in delivering in Philippi. He delivered the slave girl from her bondage. He freed and delivered Paul and Silas from prison. And God delivered the jailer from a life apart from himself. God did all this because he's so good. He loves you and me, and he wants us to know him. Children, as you go this week, I want you to remember these things. May you find rest and refuge in God Almighty. May he be your deliverer and your safe place. Come, let us worship and bow down Before the Lord most holy Before the King of glory Come and lay your burdens down Before a friend who's faithful Before the one who's able For he our God, and we are His people. He is our God, and we will never be forsaken. Hear these words from Psalm 95 as our call to worship. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it. And his hands formed the dry land. So come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, the flock under His care. The Lord is my shepherd. He goes before me. Defender behind me, I won't fear. I'm filled with anointing, my cup's overflowing. No weapon can harm me.
guides me Through mountains and valleys His joy is refreshing He restores my soul Mercy and goodness Give me assurance That I'll see His glory Father, we come to you, our shepherd, seeking for you to guide us and teach us, we pray. Lord, we stand amazed by your perfect law, for it revives and restores our soul. Your testimony is sure, making wise the simple. Your precepts are right, rejoicing the heart. Your commandment is pure, enlightening the eyes. Your rules are true and righteous altogether. And so we ask that you would remind us again that your word is to be desired more than gold, that it is even sweeter than honey, and that though your commandments bring warning, there is great reward in their keeping. So shepherd, guide us, we ask, and may we rest in the truth of your word today, we pray. Open our eyes to, to see what you have for us, and our ears to hear what you have to say. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. The reading from today is from Luke chapter 16, verses 1 through 9. He also said to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. And the manager said to himself, 
What shall I do since my master is taking the management away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, how much do you owe my master? He said, a hundred measures of oil, he said to him. Take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. Then he said to another, and how much do you owe? He said, a hundred measures of wheat, he said to him. Take your bill and write 80. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the, ones, than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends of yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hey everyone, we are about to get to our sermon for this service, and you are in for a special treat. We have Pastor Don Heckert teaching today. She is our pastor of family ministry. She's an incredible leader here at Christ Community and an incredible communicator and teacher of God's word. She has a powerful message for us today from the book of Luke, in our parable series. So I hope you're excited uh, to learn from her. We know that many watching may be coming from uh, different backgrounds and may have, you may have questions about uh, the role of women in ministry. Uh, we have our own paper uh, on this question. If you wanna check it out, it's on our website. Uh, the link is right here. If you wanna uh, put this in your web browser and read that uh, at some point, uh, we would love for you to be able to do that. And now let's get ready uh, to hear from Don. Let's check it out. Our fifth grade teachers never saw us coming. My identical twin sister and I dressed alike from our hair barrettes to the striped tube socks on our feet on test days. We were fortunate that our specialty teachers were the same but in opposite subjects. So in the morning when our homeroom classes were dismissed to go to specialty, we would go to our normal class and take the first test of the day. In the afternoon, we'd return to that same teacher's classroom but as the other sister, and take the test for a second time. We were leveraging only studying for one subject twice and keeping our grades up so that we could be on the honor roll. How did we know this twin plan would work? We'd already pulled it off in kindergarten. I know, that's so young. But we would also do it again our senior year of high school. We would also use this plan during college basketball games. We'd selected numbers that were so close together that if one of us was in foul trouble, the other one could go and replace where they had stood on the, on the court, and the ref would suddenly question, did I call that foul on 25 or 35? Ask Pastor Andrew sometime about twin play. Here's the deal. I don't feel good about remembering any of these moments, but I have to tell you, I'm pretty sure that the creative streetwise mastermind behind all of them was my twin sister. At least that's the way I remember it. Look at us. We're just the picture of innocence. Although my twin sister and I were crafty and not always in a good way, we are a reminder of the shrewd manager in today's parable. Guys, this is a crazy story. It's so bizarre. And as we know, Jesus uses parables as a teaching tool to cause people surprise that makes them scratch their heads and search their hearts. The reason we're all probably just shocked and stunned by this parable that we've just heard read is because we're trying to come to terms with the fact that Jesus is telling us to be like this conniving jerk we just heard about. He's actually saying to his disciples, I need you to think, behave, and act like this guy. Seriously, how is this dishonest manager in his monkey business getting our Messiah's stamp of approval? In order to understand that, we need to go back to this exact time and place and understand what Jesus was trying to teach his disciples in this moment. As we've heard over the last several weeks, Jesus has been using parables to teach people and the crowds have grown to massive proportions. And there's all kinds of people in these crowds. There's the tax collector, the sick, the lame, the town harlot, but there's also the self-righteous scribes and Pharisees. And in this moment, the crowd has become a picture of what Jesus is so often going to teach about the sheep and the wolves. And these Pharisees are lurking, hanging out on the fringes of the crowd as Jesus is teaching. And this young rabbi is pulling his disciples closer for this special teaching moment that's going to astonish them when he tells the story of a rich man's admiration 
for his lazy, blundering, cowardly, and conniving manager's shrewd moves. Guys, the action gets going in Luke 16 too. So join me there if you have your Bible. Because this is the moment in the parable when the rich man calls for an account of the manager's wasteful use of his resources. Suddenly, this dishonest manager is in a crisis. And we sense his desperation and his urgency in his own words in verse 3. Suddenly, this manager is realizing, what is my future going to look like without this job? And he says these words, what shall I do since my master is taking the management away from me? I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I imagine it's been a long time since this guy has done any sort of manual labor, and he's not looking forward to going back to that kind of industry either. In the same way, he's not interested in going towards the Salvation Army and asking for any help or confessing to his family the error of his ways in his workplace. So I picture this man pacing in the space of his office, taking some deep and calming breaths, nice and slow, as he emotionally tries to come to terms with, with what he's just been called out on. But after a few moments, I think his brain shifted from the emotional side to the rational side. And he began to focus on his work, on what he knows about the accounts and the debts. And he came up with a super creative win-win solution, at least for himself and those in debt to his master. And it also is going to provide for him a hope for a future, which he is so in need of in this moment. So beginning in verse 5, he begins to call those who are in debt to his master to him and forgiving portions of those debts. To the first guy, it says, he owed 100 jars of oil, but it's reduced to 50. And the second person comes in and owes 100 measures of wheat, but it becomes 80. Again and again, the manager is extending generosity and forgiveness, hoping that his actions will provide him relief when he is on the streets, jobless, and in need of mercy. The story closes with the dishonest manager coming face to face with his master once again. Only this time, his master commends him for the shrewdness of his moves. I wonder, does the master realize that he just used his wealth and his resources to his own benefit for relationships in his future? This is the part where we scratch our head. Because Jesus is saying to his followers, the sons of light, you are sorely deficient and something that this example shows us and that the people of the world have mastered. And that is in that last word about the dishonest manager, shrewdness. Shrewd is a powerful thread woven throughout this story. And I'm guessing that most of us don't really feel comfortable with being known as shrewd. I wouldn't. Because most of the time when we think of the word shrewd, we think of synonyms like sly or conniving or tricky or crafty or good at getting money, but never very happy. And as Christians, we don't want to be seen like that by our, by our neighbors or our coworkers. However, multiple times in the New Testament, Jesus uses the word shrewd, and it's exchanged with the word wise. And the most, the most important one probably comes in Matthew 10, 16, when Jesus is preparing to send his disciples out two by two, and he's already told them, hey guys, you don't, you don't get to take your money bags with you. You don't get to take any extra resources. I just want you to be authentic to what I've taught you and use everything you know. And he says to them these words. This is his comfort to them from Matthew 10, 16. Behold, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be wise as serpents or shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. Rick Lawrence, in his book, Shrewd, acknowledges the dichotomy of the traits in which Jesus is calling us to live and his disciples in Matthew 16. He defines the first part of this, shrewdness, for us in this way. Understanding how things work and then leveraging that knowledge to apply the right force at the right place and at the right time. And then he goes on to say, with that innocent as doves, that our innocence in doing all the right things on behalf of Jesus' kingdom comes without the free, with the freedom of having no guilt of any kind. Jesus is telling his followers in this, in this moment, this is your secret weapon. Be shrewd. He's saying, I have taught you about the kingdom. 
Over these last few weeks, I've even described to you the Father. And now I'm giving you the rules of engagement on behalf of my kingdom. You are going to have to be shrewd, as I have been. And then you will be known in a new way, as attentive, discerning, perceptive, astute, trustworthy, and authentic. And the right actions you take on behalf of my kingdom will make you feel more alive than you've ever felt before. That just sounds so good to me. Listen to Jesus' same words from the end of this parable through Eugene Peterson's The Message. At the end of the parable, Jesus is challenging those disciples to have an impact on his kingdom by being alert and creative and very future-focused. Here are those words. Now here's a surprise. The master praised the crooked manager. And why? Because he knew how to look after himself. Streetwise people are smarter in this regard than law-abiding citizens. They are on constant alert, looking for angles, surviving by their wits. I want you to be smart in that same way. But for what is right? Use every adversity to stimulate your creative survival and to concentrate your attention on the bare essentials so you'll really live and not live complacently just with your good behavior. Wow, live beyond good behavior? Really, really live? I want to feel that in my life. And Jesus is acknowledging this tension of our hearts and being the comparison of the dishonest manager and shrewd. But he's saying, this is the strategy that I have for you for my kingdom's sake. So the big idea of our parable today is this. In light of the kingdom, we need to be shrewd and we need to be strong-minded. We need to follow the example that Jesus used so frequently. The parable of the dishonest manager and his shrewd actions provide for us four strategic kingdom levers that we can use. Levers are tools that when used at the right time and in the right place and with the right amount of force can do the impossible. They can move the impossible and they can engage the impossible person on behalf of God's kingdom. The first of these is the lever of urgency. Desperation is often a catalyst for using the leverage of urgency. The desperate manager in our parable confesses his weaknesses, and in a level of urgency, he begins to put together a plan of action. Perhaps you remember a man from the Bible named Saul. He was an early persecutor of the Christian church. And he's also a very late round draft pick by God because he meets Saul on the road and causes a conversion in Paul to become a man that's forever changed. And the shrewd mindset that God saw in Saul becomes the shrewd mindset that impacts our kingdom in amazing ways as Paul creates what's basically his manifesto in 1 Corinthians 9, 20 through 23. Paul describes how he held nothing back and he engaged the impossible people with the kingdom news of the gospel. He says these words, to the Jews, I became a Jew in order to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became one as one under the law, though not myself being under the law, but that I might win those who are under the law. And to those outside of the law, I became as one outside of the law not being outside of the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside of the law. To the weak, I became weak, so that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. And I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in the blessings with them. His work for the kingdom would have him whipped within 39 lashes, just one last breath of his life. But upon healing, he would be edited again, and he would be impacting the kingdom, traveling to faraway places, being shipwrecked twice and imprisoned multiple times. In fact, he would remain in prison just so that he could leverage that moment to present the gospel to Caesar. Like Alexander Hamilton, Paul was nonstop on behalf of God's kingdom. He acted like a man running out of time, constantly saying, the urgency of this hour demands action. 
everything is at stake for us. Woven into the fabric of this parable of the, is a kingdom thread. Now is the time for action and repentance. Salvation and the kingdom of heaven are at hand. And in the midst of COVID, we can feel the need for these desperate situations to be met by our Lord and Savior and the good news of the gospel. We may find ourselves in a situation where we've lost work or there's illness or struggling with the loss of a family member or isolation has just left us feeling so depleted. A relationship with Jesus is available and it's not for the short term. It could be for you or for someone you know. Confessing a need for Jesus and accepting his kingdom offers you a forever relationship, a forever home, and a forever future with him. Perhaps right now, through this message, Jesus is leveraging this moment of urgency for you personally. Or perhaps you know someone that you need to leverage this conversation with about the good news of Jesus. The second lever is the lever of work. The dishonest manager moved from his emotional thinking to his rational thinking, leveraging what he knew about his work. It's not that he didn't know his work. He'd just become lazy in his work. Remember the audience in the parable here, the disciples, the sons of light. Jesus was commanding the disciples to take all that he had been teaching them and to leverage this work as they were sent out two by two. And Jesus calls us to leverage our work with faith, faith and assurance in the kingdom. Regardless of our kind of work, whether we're a student or the CEO of a home or working in the service industry, caring for the elderly or running a major company, we can leverage our work with moments for the kingdom. No matter our work, we can be intentional in growing relationships with honor and respect. And instead of focusing on things like the bottom line or production or sales or efficiency, we can focus on the kingdom and how to care for others, protect the vulnerable, and bring beauty and authenticity, which reflects Jesus' work in the kingdom himself. I hope that you are inspired to think about your work and how can you lever moments on behalf of others knowing the kingdom. The third lever, though, that we see in the story today is that of forgiveness. In the parable, the dishonest manager is leveraging forgiveness of debts to provide care for his own future. Jesus leveraged forgiveness to make a lame man walk, to make a blind man see, and to raise the dead to new life. Take the example that Jesus uses in Luke 7 when he's sitting with the Pharisees and he brings up a parable and the two men are in debt to a banker. One owed 500 pieces of silver and the other only 50. And when the banker found out that neither could repay the debt, he forgave them both. Jesus asked the Pharisees, who then would be more thankful for the debt being forgiven? And the Pharisees responded to him, the one who owed the most. Jesus is affirming that his forgiveness is as lavish as you could ever imagine. And the act of Jesus dying on the cross for our sins, offering us forgiveness, and the hope of a restored relationship with the Father is extravagant. God used this leverage of forgiveness to redeem us. And when we leverage forgiveness in our relationships, we are also going above and beyond because of the grace that was so freely showed to us through Jesus. Our final lever is that of generosity. I want to tell you a story about Amy Wilson. She's a member of our church, and she and her family have been modeling, modeling the, level, the level of generosity to their neighbors through an event called Zip Together. Zip Together invites our church families to host friends and neighbors in their backyards with three big theme nights that, that promote play and growing in relationship with one another. Last summer, Amy told me when they hosted Zip Together, they had over 30 people show up in their backyard that they barely knew. But soon as they began to play together, the kids were laughing and the adults began bonding with one another. And when those three big summer events were over, their neighborhood actually took ownership of coming together in other times throughout the year. 
I love the, how Amy says, zip together was the catalyst for God to open my eyes and my heart to our neighbors at all times. It fueled my expectancy for God to create opportunities for our family to be generous and to care for our neighbors, especially those who were going through a very difficult or challenging time. In fact, one of those neighbors recently dropped off a bottle of Clorox wipes, basically gold right now, at our home because she knew I was trying to find them everywhere. This woman also told me how she prays for our family and often is so grateful for our presence on their block. I was so deeply humbled by her kind words, Amy says. This is someone I hardly know at all, and I haven't invested as much time as I should in her family, and yet now she's reaching out to encourage me. The Wilson Yard during the season of COVID has become an extension of Christ's community. The neighbors have met several times to read scriptures together and to pray together in one another's yards. Even as church begins to reopen and meet, they hope this will continue to happen because now the Wilson boys see their friends have actually become an extension of their family. Church, I encourage us to pray for the Wilsons that these relationships would continue to grow in their neighborhood and that the Wilson family themselves would have more opportunities to share the gospel. And even more than that, that we would take this example and open up our yards to host church and to offer our neighbors the good news. In the parable, the manager used the wealth of the master to secure generosity towards himself without the master's knowledge, really. However, God, our Father, and our ultimate master is saying to us, use everything I have given you, your wealth, your resources, your homes, and all that I have to offer to benefit the kingdom. God is calling us to leverage everything that he offers us for the right moment, in the right place, and with the right amount of force to grow the kingdom. The levers of urgency, work, forgiveness, and generosity are powerful tools for engaging others to see and to know the kingdom. Even better, they come with the full backing and blessing of all God has to offer us. And remember, they come with the Messiah's stamp of approval. Shrewd is not an ugly or dirty little word to Christ followers. Rather, it's this celebrated twist that no one saw coming in the most unbelievable story when our Savior leveraged death for our sins with a promise of eternal life. It is the very daring command of Jesus to live all out on behalf of his kingdom. I give myself away. I give myself away so you can use me. I give myself away. I give myself away so you can use me. I give myself away. I give myself away so you can use Give myself away. I give myself away so you can use me. Here I am, here I stand. Lord, my life is in your hands. Lord, I myself away I give myself away so you can use me I give myself away I give
give myself away so you can use me. Take my heart, take my life as a living sacrifice and all my dreams, all my plans. Lord, I place them in your hands I give myself away I give myself away So you can use me I give myself away I give myself away so you can use me I give myself away I give myself away So you can use me And give myself away I give myself away So you My life is not my own To you I belong And I give myself, I give myself to you My life is not my own To you I belong And I give myself, I give myself to you Give myself away my life is not my own to you I belong I give myself away I give myself So I give myself you can you. use me I give myself away my Life is not my own To you I belong I give myself away I give myself So I give myself you can you. use me I give myself away Give myself away so you can use We hope that this service has been an encouragement to you. And uh, before we go, let's pray. Father, uh, help us to be an urgent, wise, shrewd people for your kingdom. Call to mind for us, Father, the places and ways that we need to leverage your forgiveness and your grace in our relationships, in our workplaces, and in our communities for the sake of your kingdom. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. As we go, hear this word of blessing from the book of Matthew. This is the great commission that Jesus leaves us with before he ascends to heaven. So wherever you are, uh, extend your hand as a symbol that you receive this word. Matthew 28. Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. And go in peace.